Kenny G, full stop. You know exactly who I'm talking about. You know the music. Na, 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 I'm Chris Cuomo. Welcome to the Chris Cuomo Project. How could I not want to talk to Kenny G? The man's a musical unicorn. Think about it. He's one of one. Nobody has ever sold the way he has sold since the 80s. He is still sought after. He just did something with The weekend. Why? What motivates him? Who is he? How is he? Kenny G has a new book out called Life in the Key of G. You see, the G stands for the G in Kenny G. See, I got that. I got that. And I also got Kenny G to talk about how it is to be him and to do what he does. I wasn't joking when I said Kenny G is ageless, timeless, mm. uh, a true classic in our culture. But you say things have changed and that affect what you do, but also who we are. How so? Well, you were just saying, uh, didn't you put out a record in 2021? I go, I've had a couple since then. And you went, hmm, hard to keep up with you. But it is hard because the public doesn't know these things unless, unless you wake up thinking about me and Googling me and looking me up on Instagram, you're not really going to know what I'm doing. In the old days, there were a few radio stations that we all listened to. So if there was a new record, you would hear it and you would go, oh, I'm going to go down to the record store. And then they would know that the record was there and they would say, oh yeah, you mean his new record? Come right this way. And then on the way, you might pick up a few records you didn't even know you wanted and you'd learn it was an experience. We don't have that now. So for me to reach people that I would, I'm, we're, we're ab about the same age, I'm thinking. So I'm thinking you're my audience. Mm -hmm. So how do I reach you? Not easy. It's not easy to reach you. But it can't be that difficult for you because you have never stopped. Yes, I'm behind the nature of how prolific you are. Fine. But <laughs> that's a good problem to have though. Yeah, Because it means so. that you are prolific and it's like never slowed down. No. How do you explain it? Um, I'm motivated. That's how I explain it. I'm, I'm motivated. Uh, like I practice this thing every day for three hours, every day, so I can get better. So I'm motivated when I wake up. When it's first thing in the morning. I grab the, I can't even wait to wake up. I'm excited about my practice session. What am I going to learn today? Am I going to be able to play the thing I was working on yesterday better? Hopefully. And how long will it take till it's perfect? I don't know. I'm going to keep working on it over and over. And that's fun to me. And moving forward and playing more gigs and getting different gigs and doing things like your show. Never been, I've never met you before. This is exciting to me. But I feel like I know you, which is so like, bizarre. Well, same here, level. same here, because I see you on TV, of yeah. course. <laughs> That's all negative impressions. Yeah, Mine really. <laughs> have been all positive, but I, I find that in like getting ready for this, it was a no-brainer. I was messing with Greg because everyone we talk to is, you know, there's always like some kind of political controversy, whatever we're doing. Yeah. He was like, Kenny G has a book coming out. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, not and, political. And and he was like, we got to have Kenny G. I was like, Kenny, well, why? Is he taking a position on the Middle East? And he's like, no, no, you got to have Kenny G. You cannot have Kenny G. And <laughs> Thank you. everyone you say your name to, one, it is, how many people have 100% name recognition? Think about it. Um, you yeah. know, Kenny G, is yeah. nobody's going to ask me, like, oh, you mean the guy, Kenny G, the guy we play ball with? It's like <laughs> everybody knows who you are forever. And when it first became... When you first became a thing, mm. how surprised were you that you had busted through genre? Because no lyric, smooth jazz right. is not supposed to be something that we all know by one name. Yeah. How do you explain it? Uh, it's hard to explain. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to say that the music has to have something to do with it. It's got to be something in the melody that touches people. The fact that I had Clive Davis and his record company, Arista Records, behind me, got it out there. But that still doesn't mean there are people are going to like it. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make the horse drink it. So, yeah, I got exposure. But the thing is, Chris, I have been playing my saxophone in clubs since I was 17, 18. So I've watched people react to the way that I play. I wasn't surprised that when they heard my songs that they were going to like it. I wasn't surprised because I've seen it that happened that way my whole life 
was I surprised to see my billboard up on Sunset Boulevard? You know, when I when my record first record got really famous. Yeah, that was like, well, whoa, that's pretty unbelievable right there. That was cool. Did you know when did you know you were talented? Uh, I think when I was 17. I, I I didn't make the high school band. I didn't make it. <laughs> from uh, you got cut from your high. That's like a Michael Jordan story. It's the same thing. Yeah. From junior high, I thought I was good. I got to high school, I wasn't good compared to everybody else. I went, what the heck do I need to do? I know practice. So I practiced for a year, went back, and then I was way better than everybody, and I didn't realize I was getting better than everybody else. And that's when I realized, okay, maybe I can keep getting better. And then I got a, a gig with Barry White when I was in high school. And then I knew if I could hold my own with those professional musicians, then I, I can do this. What, how did you explain it to yourself? Sometimes when people are good at something, you have to come up with an interior story. Mm. Like, how does Kenny from the Pacific Northwest wind up as a teenager being with Barry White's crew and he sticks? Like, yeah. what did you have to believe about yourself to succeed? Well, okay. I, I was young and I didn't, I don't, I wasn't, I wasn't experienced enough to get nervous. So I was 17. My high school band director says, hey, I was talking to a friend of mine. He's putting together the Love Unlimited Orchestra, which is Barry White's band. But it, they put it together for the regions that he plays. And they're looking for a sax player that can solo soulfully, but has to read music. And you're the only guy in Seattle that can do that. The black guys in Seattle had the soul, but they couldn't read music. The white guys in Seattle could read music, had no soul. But the, the kid in Franklin High School could do both. Why did you have soul? I had, well, I mean, I grew up in the inner city of Seattle. Uh, the schools I went to were very, very racially mixed. I grew up listening to R&B music. I was part of that community. And it, it just seeped into my heart. And Biggest so when, gift that you've ever had in your life, you think, for those years? Yeah. Because it, the way I play my saxophone is I, I'm not thinking about the soulfulness. It's just there. I mean, I've heard, I mean, from all the, I would play in black clubs with black bands in Seattle. And they all said the same thing. Man, that boy's got blue-eyed soul. You know, that was their way of saying a white guy that's got soul. And I never tried to do anything except play. I wasn't trying to play with soul. I just played the way it came out and it was just there. So I had that. And then I, and anybody can learn to read music. So I, I, I did that. And then I was the guy and I got the gig with Barry White and which turned out great. I was reading all the charts. And then at some point during the show, for whatever reason, I found myself soloing with the rhythm section. And they're all these really old 30 year old, 30 year old black guys to me, they're old. Because I'm 17. All oh, these guys are old. I'm playing with these old musicians. And then all of a sudden, they stop playing. And it's just like a solo sax. I don't know why. They never told me this. So I just start doing all these licks I've been practicing. And uh, I look up and the audience gave me a standing ovation. What and, did Barry White say to you? Uh, nothing. I, I, he was just doing this thing. <laughs> okay. The only time I ever talked to Barry White... <laughs> was at the Soul Train Music Awards years later where I, I was one of the few white guys to ever get one. By the way, I have two. And <laughs> I'm in the bathroom during the event, during the, whatever it was, it was a televised event. I'm in the bathroom for whatever reason. And in walks Barry White. And it's just the two of us. And he walks in. As soon as he walks in, I go, Barry, I mean, you can, you're not going to believe it. I'm here tonight. I'm getting an award. And it's I, my first gig was with you. I, if I didn't play with you, I wouldn't know I had blah, blah, blah. I go on to, and he goes, hey, baby, hand me a paper towel. That was it? <laughs> that was it. That's the only thing he's ever said to me. Hey, baby, hand me a paper towel. And I said, with pleasure. <laughs> with pleasure. And I just was happy as could be. <laughs> what part of the magic is the hair? What do you mean? The hair. The hair has to be. Oh, the hair. About. Yeah. Um, it's like a trade. You have a trademark? Yeah, that is. It's my, my grandmother gave it to me. Yeah, I mean, but it's like the thing. Yeah. I don't know that you're the same guy without it. I don't either. Not like Samson, but I mean like. I, I think it's like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not touching it. If it ain't broke. I've you know? never seen anybody. Now, I grew up all Italians, Jews, and Queens, right? Yeah. So I am familiar with the Italo fro or the Jew fro. That's okay? right. Okay. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen it since I've heard of you where it's not called. Oh, you got here like any Jew. I know, right? <laughs> For yeah. forever. Look, it took a long time. Have you time. ever thought about changing it? No. Because? 
I'm not, I, I'm not going to, I, it's, I think it's, I think it would ruin my career. <laughs> Although I, got, I will tell you, I, I played this one party at the, this guy in LA named Marvin Davis, Marvin and Barbara Davis, big shots. Uh, an oil guy from Colorado moves in and buys like 20th century Fox, whatever. He has these parties. Dustin Hoffman's there. Sean Connery's there. Barbara Streisand. And I, for some reason, I'm, I'm in the mix. So, and of course, Kenny, if you're coming, will you bring your horn? Of course I'll bring my horn. I got to play. So I play. And, and as I'm walking, Don Rickles says, hey, Kenny, get a haircut. You're making a fool out of yourself. Ha! That's how you knew that you were doing the right <laughs> That's thing. That's right. That was Don Rickles. I said, great, man. I'm on his radar. I, 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 we were, you know, again, and getting ready for this, even when people, because you became such a big deal in the culture that comedians yeah. had to look at it as a phenomenon that they would then make fun of. Great. Even then, it is done with love. Yeah. I was trying to find like, oh, remember that time that this guy hated you? <laughs> or remember this time that you didn't like... It doesn't exist. No. How have you avoided the things that happen to everyone else in the business? You know, I think I'm just not that interesting. You know, <laughs> it can't be. You're one of one. Well, there but, is no other guy. Yeah, except but, for you. But I don't. I, you know, uh, here, uh, here's what. Here's the. This will tell you in a nutshell how it works. I'm on the red carpet at an event, let's just say, and you know Tom Cruise walks by. Click, click, Tom, 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 over here, Tom, over here, Tom. Somebody else. Wanna, I walk in. Hey, Kenny click quiet nothing and i just keep walking along nobody cares great no it's not it great you have it totally wrong Kenny okay got it wrong. totally wrong okay totally how wrong. come there's no one to compare you to well thank you're you. the only one what about weird al no that i remember that by the way you know he didn't take enough advantage of that by the way <laughs> no he but, didn't you know yeah okay he yeah. had a he had a nice head of hair on he him. did i gotta give it to yeah. him yeah but you own an entire space. I'm telling you, Howard Stern always says that he has the best hair, but he doesn't. And that's why he won't have me on his show, I'm sure. He has never had you on the never show? Never had it. That's, we, that's we tried crazy. to get on the show and I, they said, no, no, not, not with that hair. No, I, that's not what they said. But but I'm I'm just making a joke. Another dumb decision in Howard Stern's <laughs> no, life. I want to be on Howard Stern's. I'm a huge fan of his. I'd love to be on his show. I'll tell you what. He has developed into one of the best interviewers yeah, in the business. He is. I Especially would in your genre. His understanding yeah. of knowing how to talk to creatives like you about your process. Yeah. Howard is very good at that. I'd um, love to do an interview with him and also talk about the hair. I'm surprised. I think we're exactly the same age, I think. And we have this hair and we do in doing this, we've never met. Never met him. And I would always want to. So did you have- oh, to, like, like I've always wanted to meet you, by the way. So please. And I'm not just saying that. That's easy. Support for the Chris Cuomo Project comes from Cozy Earth. Cozy Earth, I love it. Why? It helps make your house a home. Isn't that one of the things that we really want once we get home after all the crazy is to get cozy? I love the sheets, especially the bamboo sheet set, okay? 100% premium viscose bamboo, breathable, uniquely soft. It's softer with every wash and they don't crush the environment. I love the sleepwear also, gotta be honest. It's loose where you need it to be, and it's warm, and it's easy, and it washes well. I dig it. But the sheets are one of one. And that they're using bamboo is huge for me because I care. I care about what my money is doing to help with the problems that face all of us. So your peace of mind matters. Make a wise choice this election season, or at least one of them. Embrace the comfort of Cozy Earth and feel the difference. Go to CozyEarth.com slash Chris. Use the code Chris and you'll get an exclusive discount of up to 40% off. I mean, you can't lose. If you get a post-purchase survey, say you heard about Cozy Earth from the Chris Cuomo Project, please. Support for the Chris Cuomo Project comes from AG1. Now, you know how I feel about AG1, okay? 60 seconds, one and done. A scoop for me in warm water. <laughs> Vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, adaptogens, more. Why? Because I've been using it and it's working for me. Daily self-care. I know that I'm starting the day off by doing at least one thing positive, okay? I drink it right in the morning. You can do whatever you want to do, but look, you put it in warm water. For me, I don't know. It's kind of like a good replacement for the coffee routine. Of course, I still have the coffee, but there's no caffeine, so there's no crash, okay? And this isn't a drug. 
It's a supplement and it helps. Start with AG1, you'll notice the difference yourself. It is a great first step to investing in your health. That's why I am a proud partner and want to do more with them. Try AG1, get a free bottle of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash CCP. That's a $48 value free. If you go to drinkag1.com slash CCP, please, you care about your health, check it out. Um, so during, I know this seems like it's not interesting, but it is interesting to me. Brand is very interesting to me. And no one ever said to you in the eighties into the nineties and just two thousands, Hey, you know, um, we're going to like can try and evolve. We want to mm. evolve the brand. You know, maybe like, cause like everybody who was big in the eighties all cut their hair all of a sudden. Remember like from the seventies oh, yeah. into the eighties, bon all these guys yeah. cut their hair yeah. all of a sudden. You didn't. No, no, I can't. I can't. I can't. Never have. No. Have never had a period of short hair since you've become Kenny no. G. No. And by the way, who made it Kenny G? Who changed the name from Gorlick to say, we'll just go with Kenny G? Good idea. Um, it was, it I, was a good idea. But. It was a good idea. Uh, it was from uh, my first manager named Jeffrey Ross, who was Jeff Lorber's manager. Left, Jeff Lorber was the guy I was, I was the sax player in his band. He had a record deal with Clive Davis. So I toured with him for five years. And then one night, after seeing me play hundreds of times be with Jeff, Clive would come to see his artist, Jeff, and he came, Kenny, I think there might be a market for your, for your sound. Let's, what do you think of a solo record? And I went, let's try that, Clive. That's a good idea. Of course, I'm inside. I'm going, yes. But yes, yeah. And so at that point, the manager, Jeffrey Ross, said, let's, we should just call the record Kenny G and leave off the Orlick from the Gorlick. Which I thought was a good idea. No, oh, you thought it was a good idea right away. Great idea. Hmm. Yeah. So does anybody ever approach you early on or at any stage and say, time to add words? Yeah. Clive told me that a bunch of times. And you said? Clive, no. And he goes, you're making career mistakes. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll make them. But how did you rationalize it to yourself? Because, I mean, look, you've, you've played with a lot of artists, obviously, who are going to sing their own songs. Yeah. Um, and obviously, there were lyrics in almost all of them, even with, with The weekend. Uh, what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So what did you believe that kept you from wanting to do what everyone does? You know, it was just those gigs that I played early on where I, I'm just playing my sax, seeing the reaction of people. I didn't need the words. I already knew that it would connect I, for whatever reason. And when I would hear, oh, we've got to add lyrics, it's not going to work, instrumental music. Even when I played on Johnny Carson for the first time, they wanted me to do a vocal song, which I, I had agreed to do. But when the curtain went up, I played an instrumental instead because on the live show, Make or Break Your Career was that moment. I played by instrumental. And they were so mad on the show. Same people. You can't play the instrumental music on show. Nobody. You're never going to be on the show again. F you. you. We gave you this big shot and you took advantage of us. And but they what they didn't what they didn't remember was that the world had seen what they hated and loved it. And I knew that everybody watching was going to love what I did. And it became a big hit because I did that. Then six months later, they call me back. Hey, can you come back on and play that instrumental? And Johnny wants you to sit on the couch. I said, yes, I will do that. Thank you. Nice invitation. How did you know that something that isn't supposed look, I mean, we've been listening to music without lyrics longer than we've been listening to music with lyrics. Right. But you weren't supposed to do it this way. Anymore. No. And you knew that. And the yeah. people that you admired while you had your whole jazz set, if you were looking at popular music, there was no one for you to look at and say, I want to be that guy no. because there was no one doing it. No. So how did you know? Well, George Benson had had some success. Um, uh, he had sold about 3 million records. This was in the, like 85 or 86. His record, Breezer. So this was the guy. I said, okay, he sold 3 million records. That's 3 million records more he than I'm doing. He started singing. Yeah, yeah, and he had vocal songs on it. <laughs> but his song, Breezin, was an instrumental, and that was such a great hit. Well, Chuck Mangione had a hit, and who else had a hit? Um, Herb Albert had a hit. But usually it's just one instrumental, and then they are yeah. forgotten. So I went, first of all, I went and drove from Seattle down to L.A. So how did I find out who his manager was? I had to buy an album. Look down, it goes, he's managed by Fritz Turner Management on Robertson Street in L.A. Got in my car from Seattle, drove down to L.A., knocked on the door and said, 
I'm here to see Dennis Turner, George Benson's manager. And they go, and who are you? I said, I'm a sax player. I have a record deal with Clive Davis. They go, we've never heard of you. I said, okay, but I want to meet Dennis. So I meet him. I said, Dennis, come watch me play. I want you to manage me. He goes, all right, I'll come check you out. So he checks me out. He goes, you got yourself a manager. And now he goes, by the way, uh, uh, you're going to open up for George Benson at the Universal Amphitheater uh, two weeks from now. And I'm going to give you five grand for the gig. So five grand for a gig, and I'm going to play in front of 6,000 people. Never done that before. And that's how it started. And from that, people saw me play, and I got exposure, and little by little, people just connected. That's But the, I knew because George Benson had done it, even though he ch added the vocals, I still think it was his guitar playing that really started it off for him. So I thought that there was there was a, a career there. And how many times did you have to tell people that is not evolving for me is to start singing and or to have someone with me who sings? Like, I don't need to do that. I'll collaborate from time to time because yeah. I like the artist. I like yeah. the opportunity. Right. But that's not me. I don't have to do it. I'll, I still have to do it. Can you sing? No, I'm no Michael Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> do you? How often in the, when he was a big deal early on, how often would you get confused with him? Oh, because we toured together. Oh, well, listen, that's not fair. Okay. Oh, yeah, actually, I remember that. Yeah, the 90s. We My did, sisters went. We did the Golden State Art Center. We had a big argument that night. I remember that night. We did so many gigs. We did um, Jones Beach. We would sell these places out. We did Radio City. We did all these things. Great. We were really... Okay, so how it happened. I'm, I'm in my hotel. I've already sold millions, and I'm playing for like maybe five or 6,000 people a night. I, I'm having a great time. Yeah. I'm watching TV, Midnight at the Apollo. I see this guy that looks like he's from Metallica singing. <laughs> uh, you know, what was it? Uh, Georgia. Oh, yeah. And yeah. He's, I'm going, this guy's got soul. He does. I, I always said, this guy's got blue eyed soul. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, so I said, guys, who's this Michael Bolton? See if he wants to come on the road with me and just be our singer in my band because he, no, he didn't have a big career. So he came out and just started singing songs. And he was so stiff. So stiff. He, and I said, Michael, you got to loosen up, bro. Come on. And not that I would take credit for him becoming a better performer, but that's how it started. So pretty soon, Michael made a record and, it, and people started to love him. Then he became my opening act. And then we became co-headliners. So we toured and played all the time together. So even today, I'll be at the airport and somebody go, hey, Michael. And I'll go, yeah, <laughs> F you. And then the, the guy walks away, that Michael Bolton's an asshole. And I, I do the same thing with my brother. But, if right? people say I'm Andrew, I immediately yeah. say I'm going to raise their tax. And it still works, even though he's not in office. Yeah. Do you think it's harder to compose, create instrumental music than to have lyrics? Or do you think the lyrics are an additional burden? What do you think's harder? I think for me, it's easier to write instrumental music. But if you ask Elton John that question, he's going to say your lyrics easy. So, yeah. Now, I would understand that. And except for one dynamic, you can come up with lyrics that are better than the music. Oh. It happens in songs oh, all the I, time. Oh, I know what you mean. And you can sing about things where the language, the words matter because I of know. what they're about. Right. But you only get one shot. With an instrumental. True. Either they pick up on the melody and That's the rhythm right. and the groove, or they don't. Whereas you get multiple, look, there are plenty of people yeah. who I listen to yeah. where I don't really love the music. But the words hit you, right? Yeah. Especially when it comes yeah. to hip hop. Yeah. Um, you know, you talk about your upbringing, the signature blessing in my life, the gift that I am milking to this moment is going to school in Queens oh. in a completely mixed uh, community Great. where there was so much, I mean, there was no diversity. There was no majority. Like it was such yeah. like a bunch of like poor Catholics. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was just working class Catholic. And wherever they were, Philippines, Haiti, Puerto Rico, China, wherever it was. And to this day, I just have an ingrained, mm. yeah, I don't care what you are. We'll find some way to connect. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, it's, it doesn't, there is no barrier. To it. Yeah. And you were able to borrow from a similar thing, but almost somewhat unconsciously, right? Because it yeah. wasn't like, I want to be this. Yeah. It's funny. My, my schools didn't have a majority either. Asian, white, black. It was about even all the way around. So same thing. I never thought about it like that, but we all figured out how to do stuff together all the time. 
I remember different waves of, again, you know, you've been a great nostalgia vehicle for me also in oh. terms of like going back all the different times you've been relevant in my life, which great. is like, you know, all these different things. I think we had, I think Christina picked um, one of your songs for our wedding. It was one of those songs. It does not surprise me. Um, I wonder which one it was. Oh, she'll know. <laughs> then I'll expose that I don't know. And then that's a problem. No, we don't hear. Yeah, okay. So yeah. I, you know, I only have so much of my <laughs> emotional capital account. But I remember at one, one point, I forget which <laughs> album it was, but you had All White on. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's a Christmas record. And I thought he was going through a messianic phase. I was like, I knew it. I knew success was going to go to this cat's head. Now he's like some kind of messianic figure. Yeah, no. But it was so interesting to me in going back and reviewing it that I wonder... I wonder if it's possible for you to have the appreciation of what you have meant now to generations oh, gosh. of people, and not just in the country. Greg says to me, when I'm looking at the book jacket, <laughs> he says, you know, they play a Kenny G song in China yeah. when it's time to go home. Yes. In the whole country? A whole country. Do they pay you? No. What? Uh, well, why are you shocked? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a one and done for your whole oh. career. I, Who's your lawyer? I have sold over 150 million records in China. <laughs> That's right. I have. <laughs> have you ever played there? Oh, all the time. And we, yeah, at one point, you know, hire yourself a little trade. Well, no, they, they, um, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna make any difference. I've looked into this for. It's been happening since 1985. <laughs> so I've been like almost 40 years. How did they pick your song? Okay. It is called Going Home. Called I Going Home. They took the they took the the title literally. Why did I call it Going Home? Was because when I played the melody, it reminded me of my mom, who had passed away, like right around that time. And I was thinking about Seattle, and but I was in L.A., and it made me think of her. So I thought, oh, made, reminds me of home. So they took the the title literally, but my my instrumental melodies really connect with the Chinese people. It really does, for whatever reason. And I go over there and I play my shows and they're always sold out. The problem is, the first time I played there, my song Going Home, I put in the middle of the set. They all left. They all left. <laughs> no, is that serious? no, seriously. I went, I finished the last note, I look up, they're they're all on their walking out. What happened? They're, they, they, they're trained to go home and hear that song. <laughs> now it's my encore. Oh, it's my encore funny. there for sure. You talk about your mom. Um, what role did family play early on yeah. in helping you believe that you could do something that wasn't exactly pro forma? Well, my mom was a stickler for things. So I was always trying to be meticulous in what I did. So it kind of trained me to dot my I's and cross my T's. Because if I didn't, I'd hear from it. You know, and I didn't want that. I didn't want her yelling at me. Did Not you tell was... her early on, I want to be a musician? No, no, I never did. Um, and I didn't know I wanted to be a musician. So I didn't know how to tell her that. I was just, uh, I was just going to school and I got straight A's and all my stuff. I was playing in the school band. Then I went to college. You studied accounting. I studied accounting. She, my mom wanted me to get a Phi Beta Kappa key. So I said, okay, so what do I need to do that? Uh, you have to have a three point, like nine, five grade point average and take these classes. I said, I'll just do that. So, uh, but at the same time, I'm playing gigs with the black band at nighttime and I'm in the, I'm in the jazz band at college, but I get all these. So I did that for her and it was, and it meant a lot to her. I still, you know, I have the Phi Beta the Kappa key. It's cool. And when you told her, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Was there reservation or you'd had so much success already without you know, wanting to do it full time. She didn't ever ask me that question. She didn't ever make an opinion about what I should do with my life. Never once told me, oh, I'm worried about this. And the only thing that was hard was me getting her permission to play in the black clubs when I was like 18 or 19. Uh, Cause I still lived at home. Right. And so the, the leader of the band, this guy is Tony Gable. Tony Gable is 260 pounds, big black guy, six foot five. And and he was my ally. The rest of the guys in the band didn't want me because I was white. But he was the leader, and he goes, "Listen, good mu good musicianship, good musicianship." He's in the band, so I said, and and I said, Tony, my mom's not gonna let me play in those clubs, and let me talk to her. So I invite him over to the house. 
probably the first black guy that was ever at my house. <laughs> so he comes over and my mom basically melted. She was so nice to him. I'd never seen my mom so demure, so sweet, because with me, she wasn't like that at all. I never saw her like that with my brother or my sister. And she, and at the end of the thing, she didn't even say anything. I just knew that if, and it was all cool. And that's how I got a chance to start to play like that. But she did see me play with Sammy Davis Jr. And I was in his, in his thing. And it's all part of the show. So I was playing a flute solo or whatever. And I do this solo. And, and then Sammy looks over. It's just part of his shtick. And he goes, that kid's going to have his own band in a week. Like something like that. And my mom was so proud. That's my son. He's going to have his own band in a week. I cook. Great mom. How, you talented, how talented was Sammy Davis? Oh, unbelievable. So good. So good. By the way, Liberace, I play with Liberace. He was a virtuoso. I mean, I know we think of Liberace as just a flamboyant pianist, but man, that guy's chops were meticulous. He was unbelievably great. So perfect the way he played. Every note, every time. Never heard him make one slight mistake. And I thought, okay, I, I, I'm going to do that. I'm going to play like that perfectly. Well, you never can, but I'm going to try. And I still try. I will, you know, you guys were watching. That is his original saxophone. Yeah. Like from high school. That's right. And I get, I get keeping the original. But like, shouldn't you have like a hundred from like everybody who makes mm -hmm. saxophones and yeah. over the years yeah. collected vintage yeah. saxophones and like, aren't you supposed to do that? Yeah, you're supposed to do that. Okay, I'll say. So, so you play every show. Every with, show with this one. And has it ever had to be repaired? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all the time. Little little things change. Like, okay. I, have I you had it rebuilt? I don't know, I'm a car no, guy. No, no. You never no, put no. it in for like a rebuild? No, it never rebuilt. It's just little tweaks. Like if this pad, like I, right, right now, this pad has a little tear in it. But it's still working, so I'm, I'm fine. But eventually, this pad will have to be replaced. That means he has to take this little piece off, puts a new pad in, and then that's it. Only one guy allowed to work on it? Only one guy. One guy in L.A. His name is Jay. He's, he's great. Well, the other guy, he died, so I, he can't work on it anymore. How did you not lose it? How long have you had uh, it? Seriously. Like, so why? How, I, I no, would have stolen it. No. Had I known that no. it was the only, I would have held that thing ransom. It's not even a close call. When I'm walking the streets with it, it is clutched very, very tightly in my hand. Well, especially now. Now that now, they all know this is the one. It's well, like, you know. I, I, don't I don't live in New York, so I don't walk streets a lot with my saxophone. But when I do, I have a different case that goes around my back. So they somebody, somebody they'd have can't. to steal the whole Kenny G. Back. They would have to. No, they'd have to me. take all of you. I'm yeah, saying, like, yeah, they don't just get the horn. I mean, they, they, that's right. They pick me all. I only weigh 130 go from pounds. Need a kidnapping, but that, you know that's what they'd have to do. If they they could. It. Yeah, <laughs> and this is the mouthpiece is so old that I had to put a bicycle patch on it to keep my teeth from biting through the metal because if they've are let's say if the metal's this thick, I've already bitten through about half, and I noticed that and thought, you know. If I keep doing this, I'm going to bite. One of these days, I'm going to bite, and the mouthpiece is going to split. And so I started putting, this has been on there, not this pad, but this particular uh, technique for at least tw over 20 years. You mean bicycle tape, like for the handlebars? Bicycle patch. It's from making a, like a rubber pad, like a, like when you have a, when you have a hole in your bicycle tire. Oh, you mean for a tire? For a tire, yeah. Bicycle tire patch. So That's why don't that. you just get a new, what's that piece called? Oh, no. No, no, no. This is, this is why, this is all part of the sound. Do you, really? Yeah. You believe that the instrument is fundamental to your sound? Um, it's a big part of it, yeah. But that doesn't mean that, no, okay. If you it's not that me, you can't play it on something okay. else, but you feel this has its own sound. If you gave me somebody else's saxophone, it was set up with their mouthpiece, their reed, and, the, and I played it, it would not sound... Like you, like you're used to hearing me. It to me sound. or to you? Certainly to you. I'm, but would I get it? I think would you they would, get it? I think you would. You would hear the difference. I think so. Now, I have uh, another... This mouthpiece is at least 45 years old. So the guy that made this, may you rest in peace, his name was Bobby Dukoff. So I called him up. I said, Bobby, I need some more mouthpieces just like this one. He goes, what do you got to trade? <laughs> Go, um, do you want a tenor saxophone I got? Yeah. So I, so I go to Florida. I bring him this tenor. He goes, I'll give you six mouthpieces for the tenor. I said, <laughs> I'll take them. So I have five more of this vintage locked away just in case. Now, I've played them all. They don't, they're not exactly the same, but they're pretty close. 
I'm hoping I never have to ever use them. Now, does anyone agree with you about the subtleties and sound like this, like any of your sound engineers or the producers that you work with, or is this really how you feel? They've never asked. They just go, play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, they'll say, that's too many notes. Or, or more notes or something. No, mostly it's, that's too many notes. <laughs> but one instrument, I got to think, I don't know. Yeah. Even the piano guys always have like a bunch of pianos. But a Stradivarius violin or, I bet if you ask Wynton Marsalis about his trumpet, I bet he's got the same trumpet he's used for a long time. I think. I don't know for sure. So I don't know him. You could uh, throw a little brasso on that thing though, huh? What do you mean? You know, you have a clean, clean it up, you know, the polishing. <laughs> I know, right? You know, I uh, have no talent creatively, but I can no. clean like a virtual. No, no, no. Uh, you give the, me that thing for two hours. I don't, you good. know, it would change the sound the of it. Patina? If, it would. It would change it. And it used to be shiny. You just don't want to buff it up a little bit? No, the front? no, no. I, I just don't want to mess around with it. I don't, I don't. I don't think your mother would like it. I want you to, I want to tell you. <laughs> I know it's, it's looking dirty now, but <laughs> honestly, all of it just comes from me touching it. It's nothing, nothing. I think that that is so yeah. unbelievably cool. Yeah, you me too. have the same one. Yeah, it's my sweet, sweet little horn. And yeah. all the music over all the year, every, all the different things. It's every, all this one. Every little note that you've ever heard from my set on a record or somebody else's record, whatever I play a duet with whoever, it's this saxophone. This one right here. It's so fun. Support for the Chris Cuomo Project comes from Shopify. Shopify matters from a business perspective. Because what you learn is a successful business is really about the business behind the business that helps it deal with its own growth and success. So when you think about businesses that are selling through the roof, Aloe, Allbirds, Skims, Okay. Oh, well, those are just great businesses. They have a great product. Yeah, but what about what they're using to help them fill all the orders and grow the right way and deal with their customer satisfaction? Nobody does all those things for a business better than Shopify. They are home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not so secret secret with Shop Pay is that you can boost conversions up to 50%. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout Untuck It uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial. Okay, how about that? That is some trial period, a dollar a month. Go to shopify.com slash Chris C, all lowercase. Shopify.com slash Chris C. Upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash Chris C. Support for the Chris Cuomo Project comes from 120 Life. It's a great tasting blend of super fruit juices. We're using it at home. High blood pressure is no joke. Here's why. It's not that high blood pressure itself is what's gonna do you dirty, but it is proof as a risk factor for all mortality type illness. It is the number one risk factor. 50% of us have a blood pressure issue. 50% of us. How come I've never heard that? Because we just accept it these days. And I've got it in my own family. And we're using 120 Life. And yes, it's only part of a protocol. We're trying to do all the right things, but the numbers are moving in the right direction. So for me, 120 Life is part of the solution because managing high blood pressure matters. 120 Life gives you visible, measurable changes in blood pressure. It's a blend of great tasting super fruit juices that can help lower blood pressure. You can try it yourself risk-free. Two-week trial pack. You go to 120life.com and use the code CHRIS. You get 15% off and you get free shipping. They're so sure that they will give you a money-back guarantee if you're not satisfied. So you got nothing to lose except high blood pressure numbers. Go to 120life.com. That's 120life.com. Use the code CHRIS. 15% off. I have two things that I want from you. One is the- Ooh, Only two? Yeah, and one is not the saxophone. No, the, the, the two things that I, I are very interesting for me. One is from a humanistic level. One is from a creative. Hmm. So from the creative will be easier for you. Okay. The, from a creative perspective, who are the standouts for you in terms of who you've gotten to work with, who you wanted to oh. work with, and why? Well, let's see. Creatively, mm. doesn't have to be one. Can be as many as uh, matter to you. Okay. Well, I mean, Smokey Robinson was great to play with. He was great because he was engaged. Uh, so doing a duet with him was amazing. Doing the duet with Frank Sinatra, I just got sent a tape. It was a tape then, 
And then they said, play on it. I swear, just do what you think is good. I said, okay. And that was Phil Ramone was the producer. I wow, said, okay, really? all right. And I put it up. I do my thing all alone, play my thing, send it back to him. He goes, great. That was, that was not as fun to do. It was fun no. enough. Why'd you do it? Why didn't you say, wait a minute, man, I'm Kenny G. I want to meet him. I want to be in the room with him. I'm going to no, send me some tape. Be, I'm not no, a studio musician. No, to be on a thing with Frank Sinatra, I'm going, you wait, you thought of me? It's like, he's got Bono, he's got Barbra Streisand, he's got whoever, and then we got this little instrumentalist on the same duets record. I'm, I'm there. What a, I don't care what you, what I, great. But the mistake I made was that I didn't think that Frank's uh, vocal was very good from what I heard. I thought it was a rough demo. So my mistake was I sent, when I sent back to Phil, I said, hey, sounds great. Um, send it to me when Frank does the real vocal. And he wrote back, he goes, that is the real vocal. I said, boy, it sure sounds great. Oof, sounds great, smart. man. Great smart. job. That's great producing fix. job. Quick fix. Because <laughs> otherwise, you get spare cement shoes. It's like, oh, you know, it's like, hey, uh, I don't like that <laughs> sax player anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so Frank Sinatra, well, that's huge. Smokey Robinson, Smokey, well, yeah. huge. Who blew you away in terms of being surprised by what they brought to the table? Good question. When I did the thing for the weekend, I was surprised at how he was very much like me. Doesn't want to make any mistakes. Like when we did the duet together, we did this like this live TV show. I guess it wasn't really live. And then when it was done, he said to his guy, he goes, hey, let me fix that one note I sang in there. I go, that's how I was thinking. I said, hey, if you can do that, I, I, I want to fix this one note I did in my solo. And he goes, fine. I go, I love working with you. Because nobody else will, they hate it when I come to do something. Like if I do one of the TV shows, like let's say I do Kimmel, right? And I play like, ah, oh, just the one note I didn't, it was a little flat or whatever. Because I know it's not live. I'll go into the sound room and I'll say to the guy, hey, let me, let me just fix that one note before you do the mix for tonight's show. Ah, oh, bro, come on. We're, 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 we're going for lunch break. Okay, give me 10 minutes. Come on. And then I make him let me do it over. I'm like that. He was like that. And I love that about him. Have you ever had someone who you really respected um, listen to something and tell you that something was flat on it? Well, um, I've had, no, nah, yeah, I mean, the guys I like, uh, I used to work with a producer named Walter Afanasiev, and we, but we were like bros. So he would say, hey, that note's a little sharp. Okay, that's fine. I don't mind all that. But another artist, never. No, not one of them said, hey, you know, I love your solo. Yeah, that note you hit never, not once. Here, here's how it works with me. If I do a duet with somebody, it's it, it's always like this. And nowadays, you're never with the, in the same room. I say, okay, send it to me. Tell me a, tell me what you're looking for. Like, what are the spots you want me to play? Most of the time, they say, just do what you think. I said, okay. Then I send it to them, and I go, okay, this is it. Don't don't come back to me with like, oh, we're not sure we like that solo or whatever. This is what I'm telling you. I already know. I know this is the best solo. This is the definitive sax solo. And that's the end of it. I mean, if they start making changes, I go, that's it. I'm, not, I'm out. Do you still um, follow saxophone players? And do you have favorites still that you pay attention to or no? It's, it's with the old, the old greats. Uh, Stan Getz, I listen to every day. I just love that, that melodic sound. Coltrane for the meticulous lines. I listen to Sonny Rollins. I listen to Dexter Gordon. Cannonball Adderley is the great alto player. Um, Paul Desmond from uh, what were, uh, Take Five, you know? Yeah. But, uh, how, so all the greats. All the greats. Just because, you know, the, here's, here's the thing about the modern sax players. There's a couple that are really, really great out there. They're really good. Um, all the tenor players want to sound like Michael Brecker. May he rest in peace. They all want to sound like Michael Brecker, who was an unbelievable tenor player. So he took Coltrane's vibe and made it something different and made it his own sound. All the young players want to be like, like uh, Brecker. So they're all playing like Brecker. And they're playing Brecker better than Brecker. And I don't doesn't interest me that much. But when you go online, well, you probably don't do this, but when I went online... You have like generations of people who try to emulate your sound. Yes, I've heard that. I've heard it. And they even have the hair, by the way. <laughs> I've seen it. You I've know? seen it and heard it. And, and it, sounds, it sounds corny to me. But how flattering is that? Like, oh, this very has never flattering. happened before. Very flattering. Very flattering. Um, 
I just, you know, what happened was in the 80s when when all of a sudden this radio station format came to life, smooth jazz. They call it smooth jazz, which I hated that name. Hated the name. Because it makes it sound like it's it's not real jazz. It's kind of like smooth. It's like, you know, anybody can do it. You don't have to be great. It's just smooth. It's like, ugh, I hated that name. But anyway, then they started to sign a lot of people that had my sound, but they weren't even they they weren't very good sax players, and but yet they 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 now have record deals. I thought, come on, I earned mine. Oh yeah, you're just you're just kind of copying something, and you're here. But that's how it is, though. That's yeah. why they say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. Yes, I was flattered because in the creative circles, it, you need a seminal to have all the derivative. You know, true, true, sometimes true. the derivatives become you know isolated value in their own way. But it has to start. Yeah. And I know it started yeah. for you with others as well. But, you know, you've also become that. I mean, you're an icon. Well, it, I know it, two icons now. Oh, who's the icon? Brooke Shields. <laughs> I know his friend I of mine. Brooke Shields. She's an icon. Yeah. And Kenny G. Yeah. Is an icon. Thank I you. mean, you can't say it about yourself. Although Brooke will. Brooke will say, yeah, I'm an icon. I introduce her as the Wait, icon. She will say that? Yeah. Oh, well. I'll say, well, you know, I'll be like, hey, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll pay for this. She'll say, well, I'm an icon. <laughs> so you, you should pay for it. Because, and I say, you know what's right is right. <laughs> that's right. It's that's fair point. Now it's gets she's a little. A, you know, she, I wish her husband would pick up a few more checks. She's a nice person. You know, she is exceedingly nice. She is. I met um, her, and I don't know her think I've ever been with any celebrity who gets the attention three, four generations deep. Wow, that she will get because she is a beauty. Yeah, right now. Wow, today. Yeah, and these people descend upon her. Yeah. And she is unfailingly nice. Good. And not as a posture of weakness where like right. she has to, yeah. she's tough. Oh. But she respects people, respects the connection um, to her opportunities. Great. And she's just a good person. And you know how you know it? People can't fake kids. When you oh. see their kids, yeah. you're going to see what they're about. Now, as someone with three kids, they can go sideways on their own. It's not your fault. But <laughs> if your kids are sweet and decent, <laughs> yeah, and um, her kids are, are beautiful, but inside too, great. And it's a great compliment to her and her husband Henshi, who's not an icon, but he's no slouch in his own right. Um, but now I know another one. Well, thank you for putting me in that category. And you have uh, two kids, but you have a son who is a, a musician also, right? So. How did you deal with it being okay for Max to be a musician when he's Kenny G's kid? Oh, easy. Easy. Not easy. I As just, someone who had a great father, <laughs> not, not easy. Oh. Not just easy. Oh, pieces. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. So how did you handle it? Well, um, he, okay. So he doesn't see me as the world famous. I'm sure he does now. I, I get that. But he, he sees me as... Oh, my dad's practicing. Wakes up in the morning. They wake up hearing me. I'm up. I'm up before everybody else practicing. So that's what. That's all. You know. That's what it takes to do what I do. So he just start practicing. So that's how it was. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, I've got to follow in this guy's footsteps. It's like, no, my dad practices all the time. That's what I need to do, and he does it. Were you worried about? his ability to do it and thrive and succeed because of how tough it is and he's going to be your son? Not worried. No, because I, I, this is what I've told him. And I, I believe this. You get good enough, the world will open its arms to you. Not, not good enough. You have to get great enough. If you're good, you got to have luck. You got to be really good looking. You got to have the right connections. The timing has to be right, whatever it is. If you're unbelievably great at something, the world will go right this way, please. And, and that's why I said to him, just get great. Be unbelievably, you know, be a virtuoso on that instrument of yours. And who's going to say no to that? Nobody can. So that's, and, and he's really, really good. And he's getting there. He's all, I mean, he's, he's almost unbelievably great on it. So everybody that hears him play says, wow, I've never, he's, that's, a, that's the best I've ever seen. As in metal, he's a metal player. He shreds like nobody. I mean, he's unbelievable. So he just needs a little bit more time and it'll, it'll all happen. How often do you play with him? No, I don't play with him very often. He's metal. He's, play, he's playing. Kenny, you know. either you love your kid or you don't. 
All right. I do love I mean, him. You know, I don't like, I'm not a judgy guy, but you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I know, love him. You got to take care of your shit. I man. love him. I love you know, him. You got to adapt. You know, oh my God. You got to bang that thing against the drums. I, no, or something I like think, that. I think he doesn't want to play with me. <laughs> Why? You got the hair? I got the hair. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's, no, it's he, he used thing. to have the hair and then he cut it. His hair is even more beautiful than mine. And I said, Max, you should keep that hair. It's a great metal hair. Oh, yeah. yeah he's got, he cut it. He may grow it sometime again, but um, yeah. No, I, I, for, for the, for my kids, it's, they, they look at me like, this is my, this is what my dad does. He practices and practices and practices, and he works really hard at everything he does. And he tries to be great at everything he does. And then that's what they look at me. They don't look at me like, oh, he's big, some big famous guy. Because to me, the most important thing is practicing and getting better, not being on a stage and having people, you know, applaud me. I, I'm glad they do, but it's because of how great I am because of how hard I practice. You are a little bit of a unicorn though, if you think about it. I mean, not only do you do something that literally nobody else does in the popular space, okay? But you have been relatively um, hassle-free in your existence. Yeah, isn't Everybody great? knows who you are. Yeah. But it's like, you know, I mean, like you, you don't yeah. have to deal with a lot of the things. You're Lucky. a little bit of a unicorn. I love that. I love it. I mean, that means I get to go to Whole Foods yeah. and shop, which I do. And as I'm shopping, some people will look and then they'll and then they'll come by and go, hey, I like your music. I go, thanks. Where's the strawberries? You know, or something. <laughs> All right. So here's the last thing I want. <laughs> From a humanity perspective, why music matters, what it meant to us growing up. Okay, and what you meant, you know, here's the best I could get, and may rest in peace. Um, my father uh, introduced me to you. Seriously, and wow! Now he was a classical guy, mm -hmm. right? You know, he's, but he, I think, because he wasn't burdened by the words, and because your music is open, yeah, you title it, yeah, and you have your your own motivations that create the music but it is up to the interpretation exactly. exclusively of the listener. Right. Um, and people hum your music. Yeah. And they will have their own inflections. They take ownership of the vibe. Great. In a way you can't do with lyrics, because yeah. lyrics are what they are, right? The words right. are what they are. And he was very drawn to that. The power of music in the modern space, what change have you seen in terms of what power music has, what it means, how it's used over time? I don't know if it's changed that much. I think it's all like what you said, it, 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 it connects, it's a connection. That's the main thing. I love the fact that my instrumental music is left, left open to interpretation. You know, if I if I write a song that sounds, and a lot of my melodies sound sad, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I'm not a sad guy. So when I write these melodies, oh man, you must have been really sad. I wasn't. I was actually in a great mood, but the melodies come out sad sounding, but they're not. But that if you want to interpret it that and that makes you feel comfortable, great. Oh, that song reminds me of my dad. Great. Did you write that with your father in mind? I'm not going to say, and it probably didn't. But I'm saying, I love that you said it that way. That makes me feel really great, and I'm glad your dad um, loved the fact that my music gave him room to feel what he wanted to feel or think what he wanted to think. That's the big, biggest compliment. So, but I think music is still that way with people. I mean, yes, the lyrics do dictate, but you know, if somebody's talking about a love song, love means such different things to different people, they can interpret a different way. To me, um, and it makes memories. So I think that's what music is, has, has remained the same. Obviously there's, you know, different forms of music that are different. But in general, I think it's just the way people connect and feel connected to each other through music. What do you want people to get from the book? Life in the Key of G. Well, first, What's I just... What's the G stand for? What's the reference? Gorlick. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. What yeah, are you... Yeah. Like? Oh, oh, yeah. I look dumb enough for you to say that? That's right. That, you well, so about what did that you earlier. want people to get with the book? Um, actually, I didn't write it for that reason, for to, to put any kind of message out there. It was... It just started off as an idea that I thought would have no legs because I didn't think it was a good idea to write a book. I'm not old enough. I'm not retired. And yet, the more we talked about it, the more I thought, okay. And then I talked to, um, there's the, the people from Folio Literary Agency here in New York and Blackstone Music uh, Publishing. They said, no, this is going to work. And so 
all right, I'll try a chapter or two. And then, yeah, this really works. And it, and it was cool. I want people to be, I want to be entertained by the book. I, I want you to find it funny. And I want you to be interested in what you're reading. If you were to learn something, you would just learn that um, you practice hard on something and you get good at it. It tends to make your chances of success better at whatever it is you're trying to become successful at, whether it's a relationship or a vocation or whatever or whatever it is you're trying to do. You put in the reps and the reps, like I could be really nervous talking to you because I watch you on TV all the time, but I've done this enough times and I'm a little, I still am a little nervous, but I'm, but the nervousness doesn't stop me from being myself and being okay because of the reps. And a lot of people don't put in the reps and, the, and so they never get good enough to have the great experiences to enjoy their life better. So just put in the reps. They're hard at first, but they were hard for everybody at first, hard for me at first. And then after enough reps, you go, I've done this enough time. Yeah, I'm a little nervous, but I've been here before. It'll be okay. And then you just be your best. And then that's great. The grind is the glory. When you are going to sit down to write for your next album, is it something where it's life related, it's mood related, or you heard something? How do you know when it's time to create? Um, it just feels like it's been a long time since I've done something that I feel like I should do it. And then the process is very difficult because there is no way to do it. If I knew it, it would be so easy. Okay, do these things, you write a great song. I, I don't know. So it's like if I'm doing my practice session and I'll be doing things like, and those are little exercises I will do, you know. Uh, and then, oh, wait, I just like the, let sort of song like that. Oh, no, I want to do Okay, I like that. And then they just... And then you just keep writing it I down. I just so keep going, okay, where does that go? And then I'll, maybe I'll come up with a melody I think is great. Okay, okay, I'll, uh, now I can use an iPhone to record it, which is great. Before I had to write the notes down. So I, I put it down there. Let me see if I like it tomorrow. And then, uh, and then what happens is if it's good, I'll end up thinking about it all day. Some melody. And, I, it, and it's driving me nuts. Like, oh, I'm doing, I can't get it. I said, stop thinking about that melody. And then I can't. And then I go to sleep at night and it's still rolling. And I go, oh. So I go, great, wake up and play it again. So I wake up and play it again. Yeah, yeah, it's still there. Okay, now where does it go? Little by little by little. And then hopefully it turns into something that's memorable, the whole thing. How is it going to work? Now I go to the piano. What do I think it's going to be? Okay, I got to call my piano player friend. Listen, this is close. What do you think? And then he'll send me some, okay, I like those chords. Let's see. Okay, and then we come up with something. Ah, oh, this is really good. And then, okay, what's next? Drums? No drums. Violins? No viol. I don't know. It's a long process. And it's hard. It's a real and alchemy. I don't like doing it. I don't. Well, I, 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 then you are some self-loather because you have done it a hell of a I, lot. It's true. It's Kenny true. G, I, I got to tell you. This is a complete treat. For Thank me. you. Me too. You serenaded my wife. I don't know how I'm ever going to top that, but I will take credit for it. Call me later. I'll, I I'll, bring, right. it, I'll bring it on, over later. I figured out what it is. The reason that it's ageless and timeless and classic is because excellence never goes out oh. of style. Kenny G, you are one Thank of one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. I love him even more now. Guy is an icon and for good reason. Thank you very much for joining me here on the Chris Cuomo Project. Thank you for subscribing and following. Appreciate you checking me out on News Nation, 8p and 11p every weekday night. And if you want this without ads, great. Join the Substack. Five bucks a month. You get this ad free. You get it first. And you get all the long COVID stuff that I've done with my doctor, Dr. Robin Rose, and my walk and talks about philosophy and life lessons that I've learned, if not lived well. Let's get after it.